<laughs> um, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure. This is my the third inaugural lecture that I've been able to present, and they are really significant marks of achievement and moments in academic careers. And so for Iris, this is a really important event and for all of us to get to listen to what research she's been doing to get to this point is, is, is really a treat for us all. So I just wanted to say a special thanks to the provost for attending. And of course, the head of school, many members of, of Iris's department, discipline, school, but also from outside of STEM. I know that there are people here, partly because of the magic of mud <laughs> and, the, and the magic of Iris that brings us to this point. I want to thank also Aoife and Katie for organizing us and making sure that we behave and, 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 and for doing all of the brochure and all of the paperwork and all of the organizing behind the scenes. So um, Iris joined us in 2019 but she had already, already sort of made her mark in many, many ways in her research. And if you talk to Iris, Iris is one of these open-minded, um, conciliatory and really um, considerate people. And you know that there is an intellect going on behind the scenes and she's thinking things through and she's trying to work out how do I talk to you so that you understand? You kind of get this sense that she's already three sentences ahead of you. And the thing about Iris is you can see in her research that she's picked something really complicated. She has picked uh, an area that combines the, the interface between coastal land, it's what I would call an, an, um, a heterogeneous section of society or, or section of the world, of physical world, where the land hits the sea. And not only that, but under the sea. Like, I mean, you couldn't pick a, a more complex or more difficult area to study, to follow, and it pulls together the forces of nature hitting that coastal erosion, the, the dynamics of the sea. You've got the tide, you've got all of the parameters that change at that moment of intersection. And that's the bit that Iris has chosen. And I think that, that we'll see here that in particular, she likes to play around in the mud. <laughs> she likes to look at the soft, the soft coastal areas, which of course are become really, really important areas for biodiversity, but also for carbon storage. And traditionally, we used to just drain them and turn them. My, my granny used to live in the New Romney marshes. So that is, that is like um, um, driving through reclaimed land. Um, full of very, very large New Romney sheep. But anyway, so Iris came to us in 2019, but she did her honorary degree in her BA degree in Oxford. She then went to Wales. She then did her PhD on wave attenuation over salt, salt marsh surfaces in Cambridge. So she brings Oxford and Cambridge and our Trinity into the mix. She has produced many, many um, peer publications She's contributed to 13 books and made book contributions. She has an enormous eclectic mixture of collaborators from across the globe. Um, and in particular, at the moment, she's looking at Life in the Currents, which is a Prendergast supported one of these challenge awards where she's looking at supervising a mixture of multidisciplinary PhDs. And again, looking at the ecosystems from a human's perspective, so our coasts support human industries, but also how they connect with the environmental and biological ecosystems. And she's a wonderful colleague. She has really contributed hugely to the E3 initiative. And she is so, so interested in, in creating a legacy of training for both PhD and undergraduate students in Trinity. And so without further ado, I'd like to call Eris to give her lecture. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was a, a lovely, lovely introduction and really fitting for what I'm going to say for the next 40, 45 minutes. So if I sort of run out of time halfway through, I might speed up a bit, um, but hopefully I'll hit the time roughly there. 
Now, I know I'm particularly um, grateful that you've all made the time to come today because I know how busy everyone is. I know you would have had an already really packed, filled day, particularly those of you who are involved in examinations, which we've got going on at the moment. Um, I felt slightly guilty sitting there preparing um, for my, my lecture here when my colleagues were, were really involved in, in, in stuff to do with the examinations again. So very, very big thanks to all my colleagues in geography for kind of allowing me this little luxury here. But also because you've all had a busy day, I thought we'll start with something that's like a little sort of mindfulness moment. You know, we've all learned this during COVID. So I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine that you are somewhere at the coast where you'd like to sit and relax just for a minute or so. Okay. You got the place? You can see it all in front of your eyes? All right. Okay, now open your eyes. How many of you thought about a sandy beach in that context? Yeah, quite a few of you. Um, and I, I think, you know, when we think about coasts, this is the kind of image that we sometimes have because it's the kind of holiday place that we like to go and, and enjoy. Um, and I will take you through a very different part of the coast that I have made my specialism and my research career. And I'll give you a bit of an introduction to that and a bit of motivation as to why I went into this area. I'll give you some glimpses of my research to go through all of it would be probably a bit of overload. I'll also finish by giving you a little bit of a glimpse of what I think is hopefully a hopeful future and a sort of sense of that I've, I feel like by coming to Trinity and taking this post, I kind of have come full circle. I've been giving the, given the opportunity by some lovely people who uh, you know, took a chance on me and, and allowed me to come over here to come full circle. So the first of all, this is the kind of coast that I work on. It's probably very, very different to the thing you just imagined. Um, the experience of it is very different. It's, you know, it's complicated, like um, Dean just said. It can be approached from different angles, different scales. Um, it is underwater for much of the time uh, over during high tides. You know, we can look at it at the surface, big scale, we can look at it uh, really small scale, we can open up the sediment, we can analyze that and we can draw some conclusions from that. And actually, just like the, the Dean just said, um, we have this history of regarding this part of our coast as something that is bleak, uninhabitable. Um, if, if anything, we need to kind of grasp it, reclaim it, convert it to agriculture so that we can settle there and we can make some use out of this, this sad, sad place that gives us, you know, a sad life where the people live in, in really challenging conditions. And um, I've come from Cambridge, as the Dean has said, and, and, and Samuel Pepys's diary, of course, was in my college there, in Magdalen College. And there's a lovely little quotation there on the top left about the sad friends and the sad life and people rowing from one spot to another and then wading and so on. And then later on, um, Macaulay in, in his uh, History of England writes about a dreary region covered by you know, vast flights of wildfire, half savage populations uh, known by the name of breedlings. Can you imagine? You know, and it's so it's a really, really bleak place. So why? Why study those places? And I think uh, I'll cast my, my eye back now to when I began thinking about what I wanted to do. And there's a number of things on this slide here, and they, they, they're, they're sort of not necessarily completely synchronous, but almost. Um, and there's a little mini bit here as well that I can add. So um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and um, my dad was really involved in the environmental movement that took place then. It's, they started, people started to organize themselves. It was the beginning of the Green Party in Germany. Um, and I started to really question why these different uh, conflicts in, in we were happening between the environment and between us as humans. I looked for a subject that would give me that connectivity between the natural worlds and how it manifests itself between the difficulty that we have or that it looked like we had as society to deal with all of these problems 
And geography was that subject for me because I had a fantastic geography teacher, Mr. Purbrick. His first name is David, but to me, he will always be Mr. Purbrick. Um, and I went to school in Belgium, but he was actually a, an, an English uh, geography teacher who'd come to Belgium to teach at the school that I was at. So I had a sort of affinity to the kind of English language geography from, from an early age. And I decided to study geography, and that, that was the time when the first IPCC assessment came out um, in 1980, was it 1989, I think. Um, and, and at that time then, um, as I began my studies, we had seen half a degree of centigrade rise from the time I was born to then. So we were at the very beginning of, of thinking, oh, there's something going on here that, that might become a problem. And um, the, the kind of jump from that to looking at uh, the coastal zone came over a number of years, um, largely because I, I was sort of enthused by coastal geomorphologists in, in Oxford who um, took us to these kinds of places and discussed the dynamics of what goes on there. And they are really interesting places that bring together the kind of human dimension and the, the, the natural processes from lots of different angles, physical, chemical, biological, ecological. And um, we now see them as very, very different spaces than we saw them uh, throughout history. And this illustration, which is actually the result of one of the projects uh, I was on, that's called Coast Web, was about coastal well-being, was trying to capture the sort of beauty and the aesthetic beauty that we now attach to these places. They are um, colonized by vegetation that is salt loving. So if, when you have fine silts and clays deposit at the coast, it doesn't take very long if there's enough sediment in the system to raise the surface to a level where it's exposed enough for these are terrestrial plants that colonize the surface um, and they can survive there because they're salt tolerant. So it's really, really unique. So it's, it's, it's a space that you don't find anywhere else um, and it supports huge um, areas of wildlife. And it floods. It floods when the tide comes in and it floods not on every tide, but only as, as you might know, hopefully, uh, you know, we have spring and neap tides depending on the phase of the moon. It floods when we have full moon or new moon. Um, and then um, all sorts of different things happen in that space. And to study that is really fascinating because the only way that these ecosystems and these kind of these landforms there exist is because they, they have to flood to exist. If they wouldn't flood, there wouldn't be salt in the system. If there wasn't salt in the system, the salt tolerant plants wouldn't win out in the ecological competition of these spaces. And what's more, we now know that they have to flood in order to provide us with a store of carbon. And in fact, per unit area, they store more than terrestrial forests. So it's just that globally, we, we, you know, we haven't quite got the same unit area as, as forests. They serve as 775 million people directly, 500 million approximately for food. Um, they support globally important key species of birds, migratory bird species, um, really, really important supporters of, of global biodiversity. And they need to flood in order to continue to exist. And we have seen a huge loss of coastal wetlands. We'll get back to that later uh, in the talk. And this is actually, um, these figures come from an article by uh, a Saunders, an M Saunders, but it's not Matt Saunders, which is <laughs> Megan Saunders, I think. And um, I've got one of my PhD students here, thanks to funding from Trinity, who <coughs> is looking at the carbon storage and the, the way carbon storage varies within salt marshes at the moment, Juliet Rounds, who I'd like to introduce you to um, at this opportunity here. Now, when I say food, I don't really mean that these environments support us with this kind of food necessarily. In, uh, in the more subtropical regions and, and also even around Ireland, these, these environments support largely juvenile fish species, which support our commercially important fish uh, industries around the place. And that's perhaps their, their main dominate, dominant um, effect on, on, or impact on food provision. But they are, most of all, they are, um, as the Dean already alluded to, they're really um, complex interdependent spaces where uh, sediment that is eroded one somewhere, deposits somewhere else, and they shift through time 
they are dynamic, they respond to storms. We see a, a breakthrough of a dune area here on this barrier island, which is swamped a uh, salt marsh behind it. So they are difficult to study. And they're even more difficult to study when we look at the theory of what uh, coastal, coastal, coastal geomorphologists kind of pin all their understanding on. And it's this link between the form of the space, the form that you have, the landform and the process that acts on it. And the feedback between that is, is um, very non-linear, which means that it's really complicated. It's not the, the instant effect is where, the, where the, the tides and the waves run over the landform. There's an instant effect in terms of how the landform looks like to what happens to the waves and the currents. But the reverse, the effect of the waves and the currents and depositing sediment and allowing plants to grow, those are all processes that take time. They're lagged. And that makes it really, really difficult uh, to, to understand these environments. And there is an, an Irish, really well-known Irish coastal geomorphologist, Bill Carter, who together with um, uh, Colin Woodruff in Australia has written this fantastic book from which this little mini diagram is, is kind of based, uh, taken. So uh, coastal wetlands flood, and my big question for my research was right from the start, well, what happens when they flood? This is a really interesting phase in the life of a coastal wetland uh, that has formed on mud and muddy substrate. And when coastal wetlands flood, they go underwater and you then may or may not have waves on top of that. And the waves and that water that flows over them brings nutrients, it brings sediments, it allows the wetland to grow effectively, building up in space uh, over time, every time they get flooded. There's loads of complicated things that then you can ask questions about that happen in a, in a small scale. What, what do the waves do with the plants when they travel across them? Um, if we understand that better, if we understand how the wetland surface interacts with the waves, maybe the wetland surface takes out the waves energy and maybe that helps us to understand better as to how we can protect our coasts. Uh, in this case, it's just our agricultural land behind this salt marsh. But if this is underwater and the water goes all the way to the dike, presumably the dike benefits from there being a salt marsh in front of it. And when I, when I started my PhD, nobody had really looked at this at all. Um, it had kind of been muted as something that might uh, be important. We knew from fairly simple observations, like one that was uh, reconstructed here by my former PhD student at Cambridge, James Tempest, who now works at Jacobs, um, a company I still sometimes uh, work with. And you can see the difference in the water level here on the uh, right hand side, which is where the current is coming from, and on the left hand side, which is where the water is flowing to. And you can see how the plants here, Spartina in this case, they bend over, they respond to that current, but they also provide a barrier so that there's a real difference in the water level between the right and the left. And this little diagram here is just the angle with which the, the Spartina bends over. So we knew that this was um, an, an important process, but we didn't quite know how e effective this reduction in the flow energy of the water is when you have waves. Waves are really different. Waves are a surface phenomenon. So if you dream about your lovely tropical beach from the beginning of the lecture, if you go into the water and go swimming, you can dive down and you don't feel the waves a certain depth down. So the wave has a wave base and when that wave base um, intersects with the, the coastal surface the wave current here the wave action will become elliptical and the motion will be backwards and forwards uh, instead of just a simple unidirectional flow that you just saw in the video so difficult uh, or um, complex interactions may happen between the waves the, and the plants the wave has a height and it has a length and those parameters become very important in defining that kind of interaction between the wave base and the bed. So in a sort of moment of madness, uh, one of my uh, HydroLab funded projects, um, myself and a couple of other of my collaborators here, uh, decided to simulate this to the general audience by, by way of using just our hands that we had available. And so in this little video, you'll find me representing the soil surface you will find <laughs> Steffi Nolte representing the plants, and you will find Micah Paul representing the wave. Okay, see if this makes sense to you. 
Um, so what we were trying to <laughs> illustrate here is the, the, the forward and backward movement of the wave current. The plants are swinging in that movement, of course. The speed with which that water is moving is a function of the height and the length of the wave, as I've just said. If the energy of the wave that is contained within the height, you know, the higher the wave and the longer the wave, the more energy it contains. If that energy gets too much, then the force can be so, so great that the whole of the plant breaks off and disappears. And then of course you have the wave acting directly on the surface and you may then have a greater stress and you may then get erosion. Okay, so, um, it, oops, so that, um, that then led me to, well, it was, it's not quite chronologically here, but that sort of question led me in the 90s to think that, well, we really need to measure this. We need to go out, we need to collect some data on um, what happens in this interaction space between the, the waves and the, and the plants. The really difficult thing there is to measure waves in these shallow water environments is really tricky. And it's tricky because you have a lot of flotsam floating around, you've got plant structures that interfere with any sensors you put out there, any electric devices you put out and this at the water surface will get clogged up, they'll get shortcut um, if they're electronic wires, for example. So I um, looked at a way of doing this with bottom mounted pressure sensors. So these are little devices like this, they're no bigger than a, than a pen. They sit on the bottom of the of the, the mudflat or the marsh, and they pick up the pressure fluctuations that exist as a result of this backwards and forwards move, move, movement, and also as a result of obviously the hydrostatic pressure of the water on the on the bed. And you can then reconstruct from that pressure, you can reconstruct the um, elevational change of the water surface. And this is just the match between the reconstructed water surface elevation and the elevation we actually observed visually when we first tested this in, um, in the 90s. And that was these kind of really early papers here. Now, since then, the technology has evolved. So now um, we're using mobile phone telemetry, we are, we are, but we're still essentially using the same technique there to gather empirical data. Um, and uh, what we then do with that is uh, that we use it to work with engineers uh, and with numerical modelers to calibrate their models with that sort of that, that kind of input. So even in the 90s, when I started to do this, I started to talk with people who were engineers and they um, explained the kind of theory that they could apply to this problem from an engineering perspective. And if you're an engineer and somebody says there's an obstacle or a structure in the way of water movement, um, they say, oh, okay, we can model that with cylindrical objects and they have a particular spacing and have a particular height and they have a particular diameter. So you have the waves here, water level, you've got your different plant stems, an engineer, or at least at the time would see them as rigid cylinders. So they asked me then, you know, what's your stem diameter? What's your stem spacing? And I'd go, uh, it's a bit complicated. Um, but nevertheless, you know, this, this is the kind of model. And if you're, if you're numerical minded, and please just like look away now, if, if this is a bit much, but basically what you can do is you can plug all of these different um, parameters here into uh, an equation. And you have a drag factor here, which is a function of the, energy of the wave or the speed of the flow. And you have this A factor there as well. And these two factors here are actually only knowable if you have empirical data. We don't know them a priori, we don't know them upfront. And even I would argue the stem height, spacing and diameter is completely ludicrous to determine for something that is much, much more complicated uh, in the field. But this is the best we could do at the time in terms of de de developing a model. So um, we went out and we collected more data to refine these parameters, which could only be determined through empirical work. And so we went out and we collected loads of different conditions, all in a, on a, uh, in a, at a site where we had a, a tidal flat without vegetation and then a salt marsh and then a seawall on the left hand side here. And this is the height of the waves and it goes down rapidly when the waves run up over that vegetated rough surface. So if you're an engineer, you know, from that, you could kind of think, okay, seawall is really protected by that salt marsh. 
problem was that um, we, we didn't really um, know <laughs> at the time what would happen uh, if there was a storm condition. We, these were all measured under regular kind of tides that would submerge the, the salt marsh and not really deep water levels. And we actually went to um, a, the coast of the Baltic here to capture some different types of vegetation as well to see if we can quantify these, these parameters that you can only know if you measure this empirically. And we saw um, and got had confirmed in all of our sites a, a rapid uh, reduction in the energy reduction that you experience when the water depth rises. So the water depth goes up, the energy reduction goes down, expected because waves are a surface water phenomenon. So if you raise the water level, they don't feel what's at the bed so much. So we thought we need, we need to find out though how rapidly that effect of the bed reduces and we need to do that during a storm event. So we waited for a storm, we waited for a storm, we got a storm, but it completely trashed our equipment. <laughs> so, so it's you know major, major problem. We can't, we still haven't got any data. <laughs> thousands of pounds worth of like the, the department wasn't very happy when I came back <laughs> this happened um so we thought the only way we can do this is by creating a storm and by taking the wetland to a facility where we can simulate an actual really deep water level and so we got permission from um the German authorities who were doing dike work to excavate a, a salt marsh in northern Germany and we then uh, carted that salt marsh on two big articulated lorries uh, to the big wave flume in Germany. Now this thing is seven meters deep, it's five meters wide, and it's 320 meters long. So it's one of the world's largest wave flumes. Now not that the provost don't get worried, this is not what I was looking for. <laughs> um, so, um, so we a second in this video is an hour in reality, no, a minute in this video is an hour in reality, by the way. So, um, so it took a long time to reassemble this uh, salt marsh that we had excavated, and we basically patched it all together by hand with clay to make sure that it was as coherent as possible, uh, and we could then run waves over the top of it. Um, so uh, just for the zoologists here, we, we did have a few mice float to the surface when we then inundated the whole thing. Uh, we saved them all and they, they, they lived happily ever after. So, <laughs> so don't worry about that. But what the, the really important thing here was that we were able to show that um, in these really deep water conditions, and this, these are conditions that we then found exactly um, were exactly the same as the ones we saw in the 2013-14 winter season. I don't know if you remember that, but it was really stormy winter and we had a lot of the, uh, certainly the salt marshes around East Anglia and in the Netherlands were inundated by about two meter water depth. So this is exactly the condition we, we had replicated here. And we found that 15 to 20% of the wave height was reduced, the, the biggest waves we could generate without them breaking. And just incidentally, when waves break, they lose energy anyway, of course, in the breaking process. So it's about how much energy can you take out without the breaking before they, you know, they, so that you reduce the impact of the waves on the, the dikes or the sea walls or whatever. And um, we found that they reduced by 15 to 20% over this 40 meter long test section. And we then mowed the vegetation and we found that 60% of that reduction was due purely to uh, to the plants on the surface, which was uh, it just really astonished us because we thought that maybe it was the roughness of the bed and maybe it was just, but it was this 60% um, is, is the drop that we got when we replicated the experiment after we mowed the vegetation off. We were able to look to, uh, through underwater windows to look at different kind of types of waves and how they interacted with the plants, and all, all really uh, interesting and fascinating. And one of the most fascinating things about it uh, in addition to these other things was that the vegetation stayed pretty much intact. So we, we measured the uh, break, the broken plants that we collected them all at the back of the flume and then reduced the, an estimate of the biomass of the whole test section. And you can see that throughout the experiment and we went chronologically from left to right in the figure at the top there as well, we lost hardly any plants. So really resilient surfaces under these extreme conditions. So we basically then added 
to this original plot of lots of different data under different conditions, we kind of added these top two points here. We, we were able to show that under really deep water with waves of around 90 centimeters to a meter, we, we see a rapid reduction when they roll, roll up over a vegetated surface. And of course, in nature, it's not quite that simple. In nature, we have multiple interlinked scales and we, we need to look at this process in the winter and in the summer as well. You know, so there's a seasonality effect and the vegetation will die off in the winter a little bit and in the summer it will be denser and so on. So it is a really complicated um, problem and we haven't finished with this particular sort of question here for by any means. Um, but we, we also then started to ask the question, well, what about the surface and the erosion of the surface in the process? Okay, the plants survived, but did the surface stay intact? And so we measured to millimeter precision with this rig that we built, um, all cued to an exact location, the uh, soil surface before and after the experiment. And we had different plant species that appeared on the, on the section here, just taken from the field, of course, and, and replicated in the flume. And so when we then looked at the, um, the erosion of the soil, this is the photograph after we've, we've mowed the section, by the way, so you can see there's a little bit of microtopography and so on. But we, we saw that the elevation of the bed changed hardly at all. Millimeters, we're talking millimeters over the course of two, three weeks of continuous storm exposure. And it was, you know, we stood at the top of the flume and watched the waves and we thought there's just no way the thing will stay intact. And it was very, very resilient. And this is largely due to the properties of mud, which make the mud very cohesive. Uh, it, it's really sticky if you've ever been out on the, on the tidal flat or in the mud. So the question um, though then arose as to how, how do muddy coasts get affected by storms? Um, we, we know there is erosion. How does that happen? Why does that happen? We can't cause it, certainly not from the top down, but maybe once you have a little cliff or something forming, it, then it can erode and then it'll, you know, that's how we're losing some of our salt marshes globally, maybe. So um, we got some, or I got some funding from, from the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK and we started to think about this in four different compartments. And the first one was really, you can think of this as a kind of vertical cliff that might form when the tidal flat, where there aren't any plants yet established, if that erodes during a storm, you get a little cliff. And then the question is, how rapidly can that erode backwards? And that, of course, is a function of the forcing, but it's also a function of all of these different parameters in here, which control the properties of the soil itself, okay? And then we thought, okay, maybe we can also measure some of those properties from above. Maybe we can bring into this remote sensing and drone imagery and so on. And then maybe if we put all of this together, we can put together a sort of vulnerability index for coastal wetlands. And we can look at wetlands that have been recreated, restored mandatory alignment sites. I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute and naturally formed marshes. So really ambitious kind of general uh, plan. Um, and in, but we then broke that down into little components. So we went back into the flume, same flume. And we at first asked the question, what happens to individual seedlings on the tidal flat? So when you start to get the salt marsh grow, is there a point where actually there will be erosion? The plants will break. How much energy does that take? So we looked at different plant species and we planted them uh, sort of systematically in different boxes within, within the wave flume itself. Then wave, waves went over the top of them. And then we looked at uh, the scour around the individual seedlings, individual plants. And we saw that um, these are all the different colors here are different species. Uh, from left to right, you just have different distance from the stem, from the seedling itself. And you can see that there is a sort of difference between the species in terms of how deep a scour hole you get really close to the stem, how deep that scour hole is 10 millimeters away from the stem and so on. So there is, there is a signal that different kinds of species have a different interaction with the flow of water as a result of waves 
due to the way their geometry is formed. So they aren't all the same. They aren't all vertical cylinders that are reducible to a diameter and, um, and a height, I guess, ultimately as well. So this is Ken Scoutens at the University of Antwerp, whose uh, PhD um, ceremony in the Netherlands is actually next week, two, two weeks, next, next Monday in a week. Um, and you can see how difficult the kind of field work is to generate generate this kind of uh, these the well the seed in this case the substrate and the seedlings to grow in the flume. So the other question then we asked in that was about this cliff face and how structurally stable are these cliff faces? And here, oops, and here we can of course ask the question by cutting out some soil cores by really carefully removing the front face of these cores, putting them into the flume, analyzing them before and after exposure. And then with structure from motion imagery, you can get, this is rather quick here, but with structure from motion imagery, you can get this kind of um, really detailed idea of where erosion happened, uh, where the surface sediments were swelling. So you can see that in, in here. So these are all eroded bits at the top and then um, less eroded further down. And we can then also look at that by um, measuring the, uh, the root structures with it of, the, of the different species on the salt marsh and by measuring the strength that the soil has, given there are different root structures holding it together. There's an instrument here called a shear vein that you put into the surface uh, of the sediment and then you twist it and it records the force that you need to exert on the soil before it shears. And um, in a different kind of study here that uh, Ben Evans, uh, my research scientist um, at Cambridge, who's now at the British, British Antarctic Survey and Helen Brooks, who some of you might've met, who was here for a little while. Um, we put this together uh, as a data set for different types of species. And the important thing to note here is that this species, Paxinellia here, which has these kind of roots that grow outwards, they're really fine, hairy roots um, together, that, they, that that species gives, gives us a very different strength depending on the substrate it grows on. So if it grows in really muddy sediment, which is the sediment on the left, it gives us a really different strength than if it go, grows in really coarse sediment, sandy, much more sandy wetlands on the right. And um, that's not, that, that picture manifests differently for different species. So this yellow one here is uh, salicornia, which has roots that go more straight sort of down into the soil. So there is something in here in that the roots below the ground have a really important part to play in, this, in the structural uh, integrity and resistance of the soil to erosion. And Clementine Kirol here who was a postdoctoral researcher on that project and produced these fabulous images from CT scans. And this is just a quick slide to show you that this is a really complicated process. So this is the same technology that they use to look at your bone structure or internal organ structure in the medical sense. And you, you have to reconstruct the underground structures of the roots on the basis of density differences that can be either caused by organic material in the soil, or they can be caused by slightly less dense inorganic sedimentary properties. And so it's really difficult to, to disentangle the two. Um, and so she's, you know, there's a massive workflow here involved in, in doing that, but you end up with something that is really quite, um, quite helpful when you're trying to then look at the, the geotechnical behavior of the sediment um, over time. So you have these different species, again, have different root networks and these root networks have different layers. You can also see the effect of interventions, for example, uh, reclamation or, or managed realignment on these kinds of sites. So that was a bit of a kind of glimpse into the research that I've got going on. These papers of these last bits there are still sort of coming out as we speak. And I wanted to give you a bit of a kind of image of a hopefully hopeful future of where this might all go and where this might all go in Trinity. And you know, uh, of course, I think all about sea level and sea level rise. You might not sort of fully appreciate how much sea level rise has risen. There's an acceleration in the rate of sea level rise since the uh, 20th century and then into the early part of this century. The, sea, the rise in the global sea level per year has almost doubled. 
Um, and that, of course, is a problem for coastal wetlands. If you have an increased frequency of inundation, you need to supplement that with additional mud, additional sediment that can deposit on the surface that can cause this, this magic wetland to uh, survive. And so we know that we're losing wetlands all over the place. And so I said um, you know, earlier that they are global features, they're global habitats. We know that we're losing them everywhere and the projections are not good to 2100 here. Mark Schurch was one of our um, Marie Curie fellows at Cambridge who worked with us on this. Um, so we know also that there are three key things that are making us lose wetlands. One is the lack of sediment. We're, we're damming our rivers, we're reducing the sediment that's coming down the rivers. Um, that sediment loss means the salt marshes can't keep pace with sea level rise, they can't accumulate enough sediment to, to grow upwards. Sea level rise itself is exceeding that ability, or may, very soon. And we're losing, and this is an important bit to take in here, we're losing the space that these wetlands could otherwise occupy, and this is what we call accommodation space. <laughs> And if you look at that in an urban context now on these fabulous satellite images that we're now getting, this is planet, um, the, the Dove satellites from the planet uh, company are obviously, you know, commercial, we can get some downloads for free here as academic users, but these are so detailed, this is not an aerial photograph, this is a satellite image, and you can see um, the real problem that this particular salt marsh here has in San Francisco Bay, being abutted against a majorly critical piece of infrastructure. This is the, the road that leads on, onto the Bay Bridge. So you can see who's gonna lose out as sea levels rise and sediments are not available, okay? Um, and then taking us to Dublin Bay, of course, um, UNESCO Biosphere <laughs> Reserve. Um, we simply don't know what's going to happen in Dublin in terms of sediment uh, provision, the concentrations of sediments and availability of sediments to keep the salt marshes and the lagoons behind Bull Island rise with sea level rise, for example, that needs to happen if they are to survive. Where's that sediment coming from? Do we have enough? Uh, what's going to happen to the beach and the dunes here as we are rising, experiencing this rise in sea level? And this is my um, cue here to introduce you to Abby Nugent, who's one of my PhD students in the department now, who's looking at precisely this for her PhD. And thanks again to Trinity Funding for enabling um, her to take on that project so soon after me arriving here. Uh, and we have other interesting bits here in Dublin, of course, that are, you know, quest we have a question as to what will happen to those under sea level rise, like the Town Marsh development on the beach there. So what does that all mean for our future? Well, um, we have learned to live with a number of different responses to risks. And one of the risks that we're really concerned about at the coast, of course, is flood risk. Now, you, you, you can adopt a different, a various numbers of different sort of um, strategies for mitigating that risk, just like with COVID. You know, you have to wash your hands, you have to cover your mouth, you have to keep a distance. The same applies to flood risk. Um, if we see coastal wetlands as one potential element of a risk reduction staircase that we sort of came up with here, we had a big workshop at Cambridge in 2013 with some US colleagues and, and, and so on. And, and we came up with kind of this concept that really we need to see these kinds of spaces as the first so the first defense, uh, if, if you like, and that can be really important though. It can lower the initial risk down. So it's a little bit like washing your hands, you know, and then ultimately though, you get to the keep your distance. And I think the same kind of applies to coasts. Ultimately, we have no choice. We're lacking accommodation space. We're lacking space for these environments because we've encroached on our coastal spaces. You mentioned the Romney marshes earlier and the reclamation, you know, um, that's, that's our history. And if we don't keep our distance from these um, intertidal environments, then we, we, we lose them. And we also end up in really difficult situations where people are going to come to harm, uh, infrastructure is going to come to harm. And um, we're already seeing that. 
we're already seeing that in Louisiana. We're already seeing that in in on the on, just on the other side of the Irish Sea in Wales, um, the village of Fairborn, which is what this article here is about, where they they have to move this entire village, and in fact, it's not an un it's not an un, dissimilar situation to some of the situations in Ireland with rapidly rising land uh, to the landward side of the coastal wetland, but a village that is situated in between the wetland and the rising land. So what do we do? Um, and I think this is where, you know, I'm going to loop back to Trinity and I'm going to loop back to, to kind of why I'm, I'm here and to my beginnings. And I think we can do a lot with data nowadays. We have huge amounts of data at our disposal, even more so now with these fantastic satellite uh, images and satellite technology. We've got drones, we've got, you know, ways of measuring complicated, difficult things. Um, we have students who are enthusiastic and willing to engage with us. Um, and we, we can feed that data into models. We can improve the numerical modeling of, uh, that we do, but we also can, you know, bring into this um, the idea that maybe there is not a need to model absolute certainty, but to develop some sort of low cost, no regret decision making support. And this is one of the things that I, I was arguing in this particular paper that we actually often have enough data already without spending a lot of money when when resources are tight, it should be possible for governments to get enough information to get the spatial context. So for example, this is Dundalk here, the marshes in Dundalk, and they're clearly you know, fulfilling a protective role to the hinterland. You know the spatial context, you have idea, an idea of the meteorological conditions, the wind speeds, um, the water depths, the width of the wetland. You can feed that into some fairly minimum kind of criteria that are needed to get, get you a minimum protection value that you can then use to make informed decisions. And we need, that knowledge really urgently to underpin decision making. Our policymakers need that knowledge. So we need to work on that as much as we can. Um, we did that just before I left the UK and this, this sort of information and this approach was built into the uh, Marine Pioneer program where they were testing the 25 year environment plan and the implementation of that. And our work, um, thanks to Martin Rogers, who did some of the GIS work for this, fed into the Suffolk Marine Pioneer project there. And of course, most recently, uh, the EPA in, our, in Ireland and the Environment Agency in the UK have brought out the Salt Marsh Restoration Handbook that contains some of this information as well. And this is a, a good opportunity here for me to thank my um, great colleague at Cambridge, without whom I definitely would not be here, who was my previous uh, PhD supervisor as well, Professor Tom Spencer, who has co-authored co the section in that uh, handbook with me. So, we have come, I feel like I have come back for a full circle and I tell you why, because even though we don't have uh, all these black and white photographs, we don't have, well, my geography teacher is still here, but, you know, I don't think of him that often anymore, but, you know, he, uh, he is, he has, he is the reason why I did everything I did, but we have now got nearly a degree centigrade change in, in our global um, temperature. We have got a new IPCC report that just came out this year, and it emphasizes impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. And um, we have the sustainable development goals. We know they make sense. We know we need to act on them. We have institutions take action, like Trinity with the E3 uh, you know, idea. It's a, it's a super idea, and it's what also what attracted me to come here. We have lovely ideas for funding, and Sylvia mentioned the Life and the Currents project, which I'm so excited to be a part of. Um, and Biswajis is here at the back there, who's the coordinator of that, if you're interested in it as well. So the thing that has come back to me is the value of geography teaching in all of this. That's where I started. That's where I've come back to. And, um, and I think you, some of you might have seen this cartoon, you know, with the, the different waves kind of hitting society over the next few years. I think we're almost in the middle one now, if you listen to the news <laughs> over the last few weeks. And we really, really need, in, we don't just need interdisciplinary working. Interdisciplinary working is fine. It means that you kind of talk to someone from another discipline and they talk to you and you do something together. What is really difficult, really, really difficult is in having an interdisciplinary discipline. 
it's really difficult, but like most things, the things that are really, really difficult are also really, really valuable, I happen to think. You know, and it's, especially in this case, we have a 200 year old experiment that, that is called geography. And it can offer you know, quite a lot here. And I think most of all, it can offer the ability to translate and communicate across the natural sciences and the humanities. It can, it can help us to understand what we need to do to overcome institutional barriers yeah, arts and humanities, natural science, faculty of science, faculty of arts and humanities, what do we do? What, what do we do if we sit at that interface? It can help us question norms. Um, we just recently had a discussion on the exam board, uh, you know, how the criteria rubrics for marking. If we have people who are assessing students on really the more science side of the physical geography side of us, and we have human geographers assessing very different kinds of skills. That's great, but it means we have to work to to question the norms that we normally that 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 we normally apply across the whole discipline. We can't do that. We have to have different rubrics, um, and as as a result, though, the reward of that is that we we provide graduates that are multi skilled. We provide graduates that recognize that there is a time and a space scale dependency of everything they look at. And we rec they recognize that place matters. They, they won't settle for a government solution that is across the board and generic because they know that it needs to be place specific. So they can advise, they drive and they implement change. And our graduates go on to do that. And I think it's a really exciting sort of thing to have and and I'm really really pleased that I've come back to that um, at the end of you know this intensive kind of time in in terms of working on the, in the on the natural sciences and so um, I feel like I have kind of come full circle and um, I feel like I can sort of take you back to the beach here <laughs> um, and while I do that I'd like to just thank like, a few people who've really sort of helped I've really kind of thank the colleagues at Trinity have allowed me to come here which is just a fantastic opportunity and I'm sort of looking forward to doing lots of great things uh, still with, with so many colleagues of you but there's my partner Colin Edwards who's sitting in the back there can you raise your hand there who's <laughs> <laughs> who's been hugely supportive in this move. Now, Colin has grown up and lived in Cambridge the, his entire life, and I made him move <laughs> very late in life, not only to a different city, but a different country. And then Mara next to him is a very good friend of mine for here, my best friend here in Dublin, who's helped me loads settle in. So thank you very much. It's not always been easy, but it's been really helpful. So thank you all for coming, of course, and, um, and that's the end of it. trying to prepare I noticed that today in the Irish Times they talk about Ireland being sorry, Ireland being one of the ugly countries in that we haven't we haven't actually done enough for climate change for biodiversity for changing our manufacturing processes for protecting the ocean but you're absolutely right that with people like you there is that come full circle you will bring us all with you on this journey and I think we we really enjoyed your talk, but we've also learnt a lot of, a lot from you about how to do and how to think in a multidisciplinary way. So I'm sure there are some questions though, and once one happens, there's kind of like a bit of a you know a wave. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if there are any questions for Iris. Yes, go ahead, Kevin. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Iris, for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm struck by, you know, in the university environment as, as academics, we, we often get very focused on our research and we think about the impact of our research. But, you know, if you take the helicopter view of the six billion people on the planet or whatever, a very, pretty small percentage of those would be directly impacted by our research. But our teaching impacts a huge number of people and is a huge multiplier effect. Do you have any comments on geography as a multidisciplinary teaching experience and what we can learn in the rest of the university family from a multidisciplinary teaching and learning experience. 
Hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's the, the thing that the student, the best thing is to let the students speak, I suppose, you know, as I'm thinking, what do the students tell us that they valued most about the, the diversity of modules they do in geography and the different skill sets that they are taught in geography. And I think it's probably it's at least two things. And one of them is that they are, they, they learn to be able to interpret different kinds of academic languages. And that is the, the, the language of the arts and humanities and language of the sciences. And they find that that's a real challenge, but it is, it's, it's, we in I guess what we could learn from that is the is the fact that that takes time and that in order to, for that to happen we we have to take time as staff to teach those additional skills to the students so sometimes you know things are a lot easier if you're only speaking the language of science and you teach the students all of that if you have to teach students who are more familiar because of their backgrounds with the language of science you have to teach them how to write essays that's time consuming. That's a challenge, you know, but we, we, I suppose, because we work in geography, we recognize that that's really important because when these students leave, we want them to have that skill. We want them to have both of these skills. And um, the lesson to learn from that is a lesson of, I'm afraid, resource, which is time, you know, the time resource it is, is one of the things that we have to just accept needs to be provided if we want these skills to be cross-taught. And the other thing, um, I suppose, is this um, this idea that, or this this awareness of or this. It's critical thinking, I guess. It's really the that the continuous questioning because we have students from so many different who look at problems from different angles, and because of the nature of geography and the kind of theory and the philosophy of geography and the history of geography behind this, we teach the students to be highly critical of the way information is, is delivered, the way information is interpreted, uh, different space and time scales over which information is gathered and the inferences that are made from that. And I, 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 suppose I think that would be one of the things where I would look to you know, advise or bring something to the rest of college, maybe in terms of how we do that and look at some of our modules and how that is delivered within the modules. So, yeah.